I want to start by saying thank you to Chuck for filling in last week. And again, I'd say the only problem I had with that is I didn't get to hear him. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure he did. I, I have no doubt about that. Uh, it, it is dangerous to let your pastor leave and go to a conference. Uh, because I learned something new at this conference. It was on ministry marriages and so forth. And that, that's not really what I learned. But I, I was thinking of it as Jim was giving us the introduction here. And I was thankful that he did not pin down the time that we're supposed to end. Did, did you notice that? He, he almost did, but didn't quite get there. The reason I say that is because the speaker that we had on Saturday morning, we were supposed to start at 9. We, we didn't start till 9.30, so we were a little bit behind like we were here this morning. But uh, he went from 9.30 to almost 12 o'clock. <laughs> so I learned that it's okay to stretch out my messages a couple hours at a time. <laughs> Uh, no, <laughs> seriously, <laughs> let's turn to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9 this morning. I'll, I'll try to keep it under three hours. <laughs> uh, and we'll begin with verse 18. Now the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. Now these three were sons of Noah, and from them the whole earth was populated. Then Noah began farming and planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and walked backwards and covered the nakedness of their father and their faces were turned away so they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, Cursed be Cain, and a servant of servants he shall be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. And Noah lived 350 years after the flood. So all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Have you ever wrestled with failure? Have you ever used that phrase, oh no, I did it again? <laughs> I, I think we've probably all been there. Sometimes it's when we're trying to break a habit and we just fall back into the same old pattern and we think we've had victory over, but we, we find ourselves back there. Uh, sometimes we say it because we just fail sometimes to stop and think, don't we? Yeah, you ever do that, or am I the only one that does that? We, we, we just act, and then we say, oh, why did I do that? Uh, sometimes it's an act of stupidity. We're not alone in this struggle. The, the Apostle Paul shares his struggle in Romans chapter 7. We're not going to take time to read it there, but he shares the fact that often he found the things that he desired to do, he didn't do. And the things that he desired not to do, he found himself falling back into that same pattern and, and doing them over and over again. And Noah presents that to us here as, as we look at, at what's going on here. Noah was no exception. He was a great man of faith, and, and we, we saw that in the flood. But Noah was subject to temptation, the same as you and I are. He was human. And as we think about that, let's take a look at what can we learn from his experience? What, what can we take away from, from this passage of Scripture? We begin with Noah's family. He mentions his three sons. They were born approximately 100 years before the flood took place. And notice he mentions that through these three, the whole earth was populated. And so... When we come here, we find that they are beginning to obey the command of God. He said, be fruitful, replenish the earth, and that is already taking place as we come to this portion of Scripture. Uh, people, as I mentioned before, like to boast that their family came over on the Mayflower. I, 
I like to boast that my family came over on the ark. We, we are all descendants of Noah through one of these, these three sons of his. Uh, my, my daughter's been doing some research into our, our genealogy. Uh, she's made some progress on Ginger's side of the family, but she hasn't made much progress on my side of the family because my uh, grandfather was raised in an orphanage and everything, all the records were sealed back then and, and can't get beyond that. And I, I hate to tell her, but I say praise the Lord for that. <laughs> I, I have enough trouble without finding out all of the bad things that may have gone on in my, in my family history. Uh, but it was, yeah, it, it, going back to Noah is, is bad enough here. Uh, we'll, we'll look a little bit at the three sons when we move into chapter 10 next week. But I, I think it's important for us as we look at this passage to realize that between verse 18 and verse 20, there was probably at least 20 to 30 years time period there. So it, it doesn't follow one right after the other here. The reason I say that is because when you come down into verse 20, by that time, Ham has had four children. And uh, Canaan was probably a teenager at that point in time. So quite a few years actually have, have gone by since uh, the, the opening part of, of verse 18 there. Uh, the population was growing. Uh, they were heeding God's command. But we lead the second thing that we see here is Noah's failure in verses 20 and 21. He started well. Uh, we looked last time at the fact that he started with a sacrifice to the Lord. He, he made a, a, an offering there. Uh, he had an act of worship, and then he began to work. He began to work as a farmer at, at this point in time. And I think we need to remember that when they came out of the ark, there were no markets. There were no malls to go to. Boy, weren't they blessed back then? <laughs> Didn't have to worry about them all. Uh, no stores. So if they were going to survive, if they were going to eat, somebody had to start farming. And, and Noah takes up that challenge. I, I believe in that he sets a good example for his sons and for us as well. In, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul writing says, if any man will not work, neither should he eat. Um, I, I think there's a good lesson in that for our economy today and the work world in which we find ourselves. We have so many people looking for those who are willing to work, and we have so many who are unwilling to work. And I say, you know what? Maybe we've given too many handouts. Um, maybe they need to go a little bit hungry so that they get back to, to, to being uh, productive in, in society. And I don't think I'm being hard or harsh in, in that because scripture says if they're not willing to work, then don't, don't feed them. Uh, let them learn the consequences of their actions. I, I, think, I think that's something we really need to be in prayer about today because um, it's been said that when a, a society reaches the place where 50% of the workforce refuses to work, that society will be destroyed. And we are approaching that point today. So it, it, it is an area of concern. But Noah set a good example. He began immediately to work, and, and I'm sure the sons did as, as well. The problem comes in verse 21. And the problem in verse 21 is not that he planted a vineyard, and it, it isn't even that he drank some wine. Uh, the Hebrew construction here, when it talks about the wine, indicates that Noah was familiar with that process. I am sure it was a process that had been in effect long before the flood came. And uh, so he knew what was going on. Uh, it was well known to society. The problem wasn't the wine that was made here. It was the fact that he abused it. That, that he went beyond and, and used too much of it there. Matter of fact, in Scripture, in Psalm 104, in verse 15, 
The psalmist said, wine makes the man's heart glad so that he may make his face glisten with oil and food which sustains man's heart. And when you come to the New Testament at the wedding in the Cana of Galilee, Jesus created wine for the wedding. So it wasn't the wine that was the problem. And Paul said to Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach's sake there. The, the problem was in his abuse of it there. Now, I say that carefully because personally, I abstain from alcoholic beverages. That's just one of my personal convictions. Uh, and I, I don't try to impose my personal convictions on other people. Uh, one of my personal convictions is if I'm going to be up here on a Sunday morning, I'm going to be dressed in a suit and tie uh, because I'm representing th the Lord in, the, in this occasion. Uh, I know a lot of preachers that, that they don't do that. They, they dress quite casually. I, I don't go to them and tell them they have to dress differently. That, that's between them and the Lord. And there's a lot of personal convictions that are that way. And I think... When it comes to the area of, of alcohol, that, that is true in Scripture a, a, as well. I, I think I can count on one hand, the, the number of fingers on one hand, the number of times I have had an alcoholic beverage. Um, the, the first time, uh, well, the second time, actually, the, the reason, one of the reasons I don't is because when I was about three years old, I was at a party and all the adults were drinking and there was a, a glass, I assume it was a beer sitting on the coffee table there. And I was thirsty and I just came along and took a big drink. It didn't stay down. <laughs> and I, I have never been able to enjoy the taste of alcohol since then. And, and that's okay. I, I do the same thing with uh, mayonnaise or salad dressing. <laughs> You, you can't get me to like that stuff. It, it's, it's as bad as eating poison. Uh, you, you can disagree with me on, on that issue. You, you can have your mayonnaise all you want. My, my wife occasionally has some, but she knows there's only about one or two dishes that she can put it in that, that I will tolerate it in. Uh, that, that's just my personal background and, and conviction there. But um, the... the, the First time that I knowingly took alcohol was when I was in Indian work uh, up, up in Canada. Now, one of the conditions we had for working out in the, in the Indian villages was you did not have alcohol in your home. And the reason for that is they could not handle it. As a matter of fact, they would send the little kids, four or five years old, over to the house and they'd say, mom is baking a cake, can we borrow a bottle of vanilla? because there's alcohol in, in that bottle of vanilla and those little kids like to drink it. <laughs> uh, 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 so so we, we had to abstain from it there. But, but uh, we were working in a church in, in Quinell, the Evangelical Free Church, or I, I was living in the church actually and we were doing youth work. When one of the uh, parents of one of the kids that we had in our youth group asked if we would come over for dinner and she said, I want you to come about a half hour before my husband gets home from work. I've got something to share with you. And so we did. Uh, we had never met him. We, we had met her. She came to church on a regular basis. We got there. She said, now, my husband is going to ask you to have a glass of wine with the dinner. Now, they both came from Germany. That was their tradition that they had grown up with. Uh, they did not have a problem with, with uh, drunkenness or anything. But she said, the problem that we are facing is we were going to another church in town and when they found out that my husband drank a glass of wine with a dinner, they asked him to leave the church. And uh, she said he hasn't been back to church since. So he said, he's, he's going to ask you. And she said, I, I can't tell you to do it, but you gotta be prepared. And I said, okay. Um, he came home, we visited for about 15 minutes before dinner was on the table. He said probably two or three words that, that whole time. Just didn't want to talk to this missionary that was in his home. Uh, we, we sat down, he he's got his bottle of wine out and he asked if we would like to have a glass. And I said, yes, we, we, we would do that. 
You know, he was altogether different after that. We were able to open up and, and talk about spiritual things with him and, and so forth there. So uh, I, I, I still wonder what would have been his response if we had said no. We're totally against it. Now, I can't say that I enjoyed that glass of wine. <laughs> but uh, I, I did enjoy getting to know him and being able to, to, to share something with him here. I, I personally don't I abstain from it because I, I, in my position, I think it sets a wrong example. There, there are many people that, that struggle with uh, alcoholism, and, and I don't want to be the stumbling block to that. And so I, I personally choose, besides that I don't like it, I personally choose not to do it there. And then uh, I, I, another area comes out of Psalm chapter 31. I, I, uh, in, in verse uh, 3 and 4, it's actually the, the mother of King Lemuel. Now, we're not sure who King Lemuel was. I think it's probably Solomon, but uh, it, Scripture doesn't really conclusively say that. But, but she says, don't give your strength to women or your ways to that which destroys kings. It's not for kings, O Lemuel, it's not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to desire strong drink, lest they forget, drink and forget what is decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. Give strong drink to him who is perishing and wine to him whose life is bitter. And if it was important for kings not to get involved so that they could not think straight, then I think it's important for me as a pastor to to do the same thing. Now, I, I'm not suggesting in that, that if you want to have a glass of wine, I, I, I have no problem with that. Like I said, I'm not forcing my convictions on, on, on somebody else there, but I don't want to be the one that caused somebody else to stumble there. I, I like the example that my son set. After he left home, after he graduated from college, he, he got involved in, in making his own wine, actually. And, and he, he did that for several years. I, I was rather surprised when we went to visit him one time and all of his winemaking equipment was gone. I, I asked him about it, he said, oh, I got rid of it. And I said, well, why? Uh, and he said, well, he said, uh, we have two little girls now and I don't want to pass that on to them because his, mother, his wife, uh, her parents were alcoholics. And so it, it, there was that struggle in the family. He said, I don't want to tempt them. And so I've given it up. I thought, what, what a remarkable uh, insight that was on his part and, and a, a remarkable choice there. The, the problem comes in Ephesians 5 where he says, don't be drunk with wine, where in his excess, but be filled with the spirit. Noah went too far in his drinking in this passage. He became drunk and it led to problems with, within the family. For him, it led to exposure and it led to shame. Ham is the one that discovers him. Now, again, we read it and think, well, what, what's so serious about this incident? So what, he came in and found his dad was naked and so forth. The, the word that is used here, where it says Ham saw, doesn't mean a casual glance. The word implies that somebody has crossed a, bar uh, a, a boundary there. We, we see the same word, and it's only used a couple times in Scripture. We see the same word used in 1 Samuel chapter 6, uh, in verse 19. If you read the context there, it's David is trying to bring the ark to Jerusalem. It had been captured by the Philistines, had been away from Jerusalem for many years. And David thought it would be great to have the ark in Jerusalem as the capital of the, of the nation. Only problem is he didn't take the time to, uh, to do it properly there. Well, actually, this is before this. Uh, the, the Lord deals with the uh, Canaanites for, or the Philistines for taking the ark. And, and, it, and it's sent back to Israel. And when you come down to verse 19, you, you read, he struck down some of the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Matter of fact, he struck down 50,070 men because they dared to look into the ark. 
they crossed a boundary. This was off limits. No one was to look into the ark. As a matter of fact, the average person didn't even get to see the ark when it was in the temple or in the tabernacle and then in the temple as, as well. So, so they, they had crossed a, a boundary there. And, and what boundary did Ham cross? We don't know. But that's the implication from, from the verb that is used here in, in Genesis. And, and I know, don't really think that we need to know what that boundary was. Uh, there, there's some things in scripture that we just don't need to know why it happened the way it did. In Romans chapter 16, Paul says, I want you to be innocent in that which is good, harmless in what is evil. We, we don't need to dig into some of those things to, to find out what, what was evil about it. We simply know that he crossed the line somewhere. Uh, he rejoiced in, in his father's failure. Proverbs 24 verse 17 warns us, don't rejoice. Even when your enemy falls, don't rejoice. Um, because God may bring that same problem back in, in, into your life there. And as we read the story, I, I think, and I'm reading between the lines, but evidently Canaan was there as well, uh, Ham's son. Now, it's important for us to realize Noah's act did not take God by surprise. Back in, in uh, chapter 8, verse 21, it, it speaks of the fact that as as that they made their sacrifice and so forth. God is speaking to them. Uh, he, he speaks of the fact, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And, and goes on to say, I'm not going to destroy the world again with, with, with another flood there. God knew that there was that element in Noah. He, he was a human the same as we are. He, God wasn't taken by surprise here. But I like the action of Ham's two brothers here. Ham comes out, tells them what was going on, and the word tell that he uses here in Hebrew means to tell with delight. For some reason, this was great. As far, I don't know what the problem was between Ham and Noah, but he thought this was great, and he wanted to share it and, and share his father's failure with his two brothers and so forth. Uh, you ever tempted to do that? Somebody fails, somebody falls, and we want to tell somebody about it, don't we? We, we, we want to be the one with, with, with that kind of news. Uh, don't do that. Uh, uh, love, it says in the New Testament, covers a multitude of sin. And, and that's what Ham failed to do here. He failed to cover the sin of his father. But that leads us to the third point here, to Noah's footprints in 22 to 23. Whether we are aware of it or not, I would suggest today that our actions have a profound effect on others, sometimes for good, sometimes for evil. And we need to be careful of the footprints that we leave behind us. I, in a small way, saw that in my old, older brother. He went away to Prairie Bible Institute, um, came back, and for some reason, he told a lie about something that I supposedly did. It never happened, but uh, my parents said, well, hey, he's in Bible school. He wouldn't tell a lie. Uh, and so I got punished for something I didn't do. Now, that's uh, probably a lot of things I should have gotten punished for that I didn't. <laughs> but I didn't like being punished for what I, I didn't do. Uh, you know, his action left uh, a permanent scar, in a sense, on me at that time. Because when I graduated a year later from school, I, I said, there's no way I will go to the same school that he went to. If that's what they, he learned there, I want nothing to do with that school. And I went completely the opposite direction. We, we never know what our actions and our words are going to do to somebody else. Uh, years ago, uh, on TV, I, I saw a, an ad of a couple, a, a father and a son. They were washing the car together and uh, having a good time at it. And then they were finished. They sat down, leaned against a tree to rest. The dad takes out 
a cigarette and, and it lights up. And the camera shows the little boy reaching over for the package of cigarettes. Where did he learn that? From dad. Yeah, it, it was the footprint that his father was leaving behind there. When Noah sobers up, he's aware of the fact that he left the wrong impression. Uh, and I, I guess the problem with that is we need to be careful because our children are watching us. What are we saying to them? What, what are, are we saying to our neighbors by the way we conduct ourselves in the, in the community and so forth? Are, are we demonstrating the, the character of Christ to them? That leads to mankind's future here, verses 24 through 29. And we will build on that next time when we come into chapter 10. But Noah, when he realizes what happened, pronounces, first of all, a curse upon Canaan and his descendants. Now, the obvious question is, why did he pronounce a curse on Canaan? Now, I'm assuming that Canaan was with his father when, when this happened, but wasn't his father responsible? Why, why didn't he pronounce the curse upon Ham? Well, if you go back to chapter 9 and verse 1, uh, we, we find that God blessed Noah and his sons. We can't curse what God has blessed. Uh, Balaam tried that, remember? Balak hired him to, to curse the nation of Israel, and uh, several times they offered a sacrifice, and, and uh, Balaam really wanted the reward that, that Balaam, Balak was offering him. But he had to come to the conclusion, I cannot curse what God has blessed. And so I, I think the same thing was, was true here. God had pronounced a blessing upon Ham. Uh, Noah could not change that. Uh, Proverbs 26, verse 2 says, A curse causeless will not fall. You just can't do that. And I wonder, perhaps Noah also saw the perversity that was in Canaan, because Canaan was the father of the Canaanites. And I realized years ago it was popular to say, well, hey, this was no, Canaan was the father of the, the African nations, and that's why we had slavery, justified slavery. That, that's not the case. Noah was not, or Ham was not the father of the African nations. He was the father of the Canaanites that were living in the land that Abraham eventually inherited there. And they became a, a very corrupt and a very perverse people. Their worship was idolatrous. It involved all kinds of sexual perversions. It involved ch child sacrifices and so forth. And, and I can't help but wonder, did some of that start with Canaan at, and maybe even Ham at this point in time? Uh, I, I read Exodus 20, verse 5. It says, you shall not worship them. He's talking about idols here. This is in the Ten Commandments. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, uh, uh, we need to be careful with that verse. He, he's not saying that our descendants are automatically going to become like us. But it's more than likely that they will follow the example that they saw in us. And that, I think, was true in, in the life of Ham and, and Cain in there. It, it's not automatic. We do have a choice to make. I, I think of some of the Canaanites, if, if you recall the story when the children of Israel moved into the Promised Land. Do you remember the first person they, they dealt with there? Was Rahab. And she was a recipient of God's grace. And so here she had grown up in that system, and yet God was able to reach out and, and reach her and to reach our, her family as well. But by and large, kids often follow the example that mom and dad set. Uh, and many times they uh, rebel against it for a time. Uh, but someone has wisely said the, the hippies, and I, I know I'm showing my age in that because I was of that generation, uh, that the hippies became, in the 1990s, the yuppies. Why did they make that change? They learned it from mom and dad. 
and they eventually went back to the roots that they had uh, and what they saw as, as children there. So we, we need to be careful. What, are, uh, what heritage are we leaving to our family and, and to our, our, not only our children, but to our, our grandchildren as well there? But again, as I say that, it's not automatic. There was ones like Rahab. There were others that came to worship the true God. And, and so don't let the past or, or don't let your up bringing defeat you. Don't blame your choices on mom and dad. It, no. If you make that choice, it's your choice. Don't blame it on society and, and don't blame it on, on the school or the school system. You made your choice. You have to live with that fact. And, and, uh, and yet there, there was that danger that that perversion was going to pa be passed down from generation to generation. There's also a blessing pronounced here on Shem and on Japheth now. Uh, we, we will look at that again next week. I'm going to resist the temptation to go to 2.30. I, I don't think I'll, I'll do that today. But uh, we'll, we'll come back to that in chapter 10. But as we think of the blessing that he pronounces on his two sons and, and how that's played out in, in the future, I, I want us to look at the fact that Noah's life is summed up for us here in verses 28 and 29. It, it speaks of the fact that he lived 350 years after the flood. So that puts him up to somewhere around 950 years before he died. I don't know about you, but I have no desire to live that long. <laughs> I know our scientists are talking about being able to extend life to a thousand years. There has to be an awful lot of changes take place before I'd want to stay in this world for, for a thousand years. I, I'd much rather be home with, with God in, in, in glory there. But he did live. He was the third oldest of the patriarchs that we know about there. He actually dies just two years before Abraham is born. And so can you imagine the influence that he had for good all of that time and the testimony that he had and how he was able to share what God did in the flood and what God did in his life and, and heart and, and so forth over the years. And, and, and as I think about that, I think, well, why did God re uh, put this incident, this one little incident from 350 years of his life, why did he put this one failure in the Bible? I, and I can't help but think of what Paul said in Romans chapter four, 15, I believe it's verse 4, that the things were written beforehand were written for our learning, that we through comfort and patience might have hope. Uh, God put it in, the, in here for a reason. And, and I think one of the reasons that we see is God is honest when he looks at our life. We see Noah as he falls and gets drunk and disgraces himself. We read the story of Moses and he had a time of failure as well. Remember, he struck the rock twice in his anger. He had a problem with, with anger there. All of that he accomplished and all of he, that he did, why did God put that in Scripture? And then there was David, the, the tremendous con conquest that he had, the, the tremendous victories and, and what he did for the nation. And then as you're reading his story, he has to put in there the account of his sin with Bathsheba. Why in the world are, are these failures there for us? I, I think it's a reminder to us of several things. Uh, and when I say this, I, I want you to remember that someday you're going to have to give an account of your life to the Lord. First Corinthians chapter 3 speaks of the, the judgment seat of Christ and so forth there. And uh, we're going to watch and see whether the works and so forth of our life are burned up or whether they remain. We're going to have to give an account to God. But the, the, I want to bring th three applications out, out of this story for us to consider today. First of all, I want us to remember, number one, we are all human. Have you come to grips with that in your own life? Uh, it's good for us to remember 1 Corinthians 10, 12, where Paul said, let him who thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. If Noah could fall, if Moses could get angry and, and 
have problems if, if uh, David could be led into temptation, guess what? You and I can as well. We are human. And so we need to be careful. We need to have some safeguards in our life. We need God's Holy Spirit to guide us and, and to protect us as, as we walk through this life. And I think as we say that, we also need to be careful about judging and condemning others. Uh, I, I like the story of D.L. Moody. That he was in, in a city having some evangelistic campaigns, and, and before he went to bed, he was looking out the window, and there was a drunk stumbling down the street. Somebody else saw it and, and kind of laughed at, at, at the individual. And D.L. Moody stopped him and said, there but for the grace of God go I. If Noah could fail, if David could fail, if, if Moses, we could too. Galatians chapter 6 deals with a, a brother that has failed. He said, you that are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. And he goes on to give that warning. He says, consider in yourself, lest you also be tempted. We are tempted because we're human. We need the Spirit of God to help us to resist that temptation. And praise the Lord. He didn't stop in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, by, by, by saying that uh, we're in danger of the same thing. He goes on to say in verse 13 that uh, God will make a way of escape with whatever temptation comes into our heart and life. So we don't have to fall as Noah did. We, we don't have to fail as, as David. God is able to give us that way of escape. We just have to be open to that and allow God to guide us in that. The, the second lesson that I learned from this passage is that we need to be careful of our footprints. What are we leaving? What example are we setting for those who are watching our lives? It may be our children, maybe our grandchildren. Now we got to wrestle with the fact that it may be our great grandchild. <laughs> uh, you're never done that job until you're home in glory. But it also may be somebody on the job. It may be somebody out there that uh, is living next door to you. Do they, do they get to see the character of Christ through your life? I, I'm reminded of when I was a fireman back in. South Dakota. There was a, a, a firefighter there that wanted nothing to do with God. And he knew I was a pastor. And so he would use the, the most filthy language he could use in, in my presence just to see what kind of reaction he would get out of me. And I, fortunately, I never really told him what I thought. <laughs> because the day came when we were working on some of the trucks and uh, we needed a part that was clear back in the back of the fire hall. And I said, I'll go get it. I, I'm not a mechanic, but I can get the, run and get the parts for the mechanics. And, and when I got to the back, and it, it was quite crowded back there because we had a, another truck or two parked back there and, and just barely enough room to, to walk back and jump in the truck if you had to, and a closet behind that. As I get to the closet, I realize somebody's following me. And I turn around and here is this young man with his filthy language. And I'm wondering, what's he gonna say this time? And uh, he stopped and he said, can I ask you something? And I said, sure. And with tears in his eyes, he said, would you pray for my brother? He's just been sent to Iraq. This was during the Gulf War. He said, would you remember him in prayer? And the amazing thing is I didn't get to to lead him to Christ that day. But he did clear up his language. Uh, God had spoken to his heart and, and was continuing to, to speak to that. You never know who's watching your life and what they might see. First Corinthians chapter 11, the apostle Paul in verse one said, be followers of me as I am of Jesus Christ. Can you say that to someone else? Follow me as I follow Jesus Christ. Are, are you setting a, a positive example for good as you walk through this life? What, what heritage are you leaving to your family? Years ago, we used to sing in Sunday school that little chorus, oh, be careful, little eyes what you see, oh, be careful, little ears what you hear. You know, it, it went through uh, little feet where you go and so forth. Uh, uh, 
And it, the reason for that in that song was for the Father up above is, is looking down his love. He sees what you're doing. But I'd like to extend that song to your community, your neighbors, your family. They are seen. What are they seeing? What, what footprint are you leaving behind as you walk through this life? Is it something that they, is worth copying in their life? Are, are, are they seeing the love of Christ at action, in action in you? And then the third thing that I think we need to learn from this is one failure does not make you a failure. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he's what? He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We may fail at times, uh, but isn't it great that when we recognize that and we ask God's forgiveness, in a sense, he picks us up, puts us back on our feet, and says, start over again. Get moving. I've got, a, I've got a job for you to do. We may use that phrase at times, oh, no, I did it again. But God says, get up and move forward. Now, he, he knows where we are at and what we need. So as we think about this passage, are you facing a temptation today, just as Noah did? Maybe it, you've made some wrong choices out of ignorance or stupidity. Are, are you willing to come to the Lord and say, Father, I ask your forgiveness. I, I, I know what I did what was wrong. Bring that failure to him, and you're no longer a failure. It, it's up to us. What are we willing to do? excuse me, about it. We may need to, to pray, Lord, I need your help to resist. I, I, I need your strength. I need you to show me the, the way of escape. We may need to pray for wisdom. God is able to do all of that for us in the midst of the trial. He, he is there for us, but we have to ask. And then as I think about that, be careful how you judge somebody else. They may have some different convictions than what you have. If there is no, thus saith the Lord, then be careful how you judge them. Uh, now, personally, I can't find a thus saith the Lord in Scripture that I have to wear this suit and tie on Sunday morning. And I, I know in the summertime, I've often been told, you don't have to do that. And, and I appreciate that. But I'm going to do it anyhow. <laughs> because that, that's my personal conviction. But I don't care whether you have that conviction or not. I, I don't care if anybody else wears a suit or tie. I, I don't care if any other pastor does. That's, that's between them and the Lord. That's an area of liberty. I don't care whether you eat mayonnaise or not. <laughs> you just don't ask me to eat it. <laughs> uh, and, and I will eat it if it's served and I have no other choice. Uh, that, that I have done that. Uh, but uh, personally, if I have the choice, I am going to avoid it like I would avoid poison. <laughs> now, uh, 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 the same is true of if somebody wants to have a glass of wine, I don't have a problem with that. Just don't expect me to have to like it and do it because I like it. Uh, let God be God in your brother and your sister's life. Don't judge them on superficial matters. The important area is, are they living out their convictions for the glory of Jesus Christ? Uh, and you wonder sometimes, and I wonder sometimes, why does God bring certain convictions into my life and not into yours? Uh, wouldn't it be great if he brought the same convictions into everybody's life? Now, I'm not talking about scripture, uh, thus saith the Lord. Uh, I'm talking about areas where there is no thus saith the Lord. Wouldn't it be great if we all thought alike? No, it wouldn't actually, because you know what? God has a different purpose for each one of us. God's going to use you to touch somebody's life in this community that I'm never going to be able to touch. And so he's convicted you in ways that will enable you to be the example that he wants you to be to that person. And, and uh, I, I had to set my conviction aside to, for the sake of an individual there 
the story I shared took place in Quinell uh, with a glass of wine. Uh, I don't know of any other way that he would, eventually he did come back to the Lord and uh, God worked in his heart. I, I'd like to think that that was one step in, in that journey. So be careful how you judge one another. Uh, remember, God is the one that they have to answer to, not you. And, and so be careful in those areas. So are you living out your conviction? Are you being the example? Are you being the testimony that God wants you to be to the people that he brings into your life? Can you, like the Apostle Paul say, be imitators of me as I am of Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus Christ and all that he did for us. And we marvel sometimes that you use us to bring the gospel message to somebody else. That you use us to help shape and impart values to our children and, and to friends around us. We, we wonder sometimes, how in the world can you use us? But you do. Give us the courage to live out the convictions that you place upon us to the glory of Jesus Christ. And give us the wisdom to know that we're not a brother's judge in those areas where there's no thus saith the Lord. And let you be God in their lives as you are in ours. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.